some headlines around the place today about the, the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive making some well, breakthroughs and significant ground. Give us a, an objective analysis, Chip. Well, all tactical problems really are a function of four things, ground, enemy, time and space. And that conditions how quickly you can do things. So certainly at the moment, the sword is stronger than the shield, but only marginally. And there are still a number of key variables out there. So there have been gains towards Verbove from Robertine in Zaporizhia. There have been gains south of Bakhmut in Plishivka and uh, around Ad- Adivka. Those are tangibles, which if you're Ukrainian are really good. And I mentioned about this relationship between ground enemy, time, space. Then then the key thing is whether they'll run out of time and space. And all those are very tactical things, capturing villages and things. They're not operational level. And the time and space thing really is a function of two things at the moment. The first thing is the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, on the 8th of September, saying that there's a realistic probability that Ukraine can breach the second and third Russian defensive lines by the end of the year and in intelligence yardsticks, that's quite a high possibility. But then you contrast that with the fact that General Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has said on the 10th of September that there are only probably 30 to 45 days of fighting left conditioned by ammunition expenditure, the weather reserves and losses. So it would be a better question to say where we are at the operational level mm. by the end of October when Ukraine really needs to have done a number of things. For operational effect, it needs to have cut the railway at top Mac. It needs a minimum of fire control over the M14, which is the highway that runs from Melitopol to Mariupol. It needs to somewhere be in the position to drop the uh, Kercher Bridge and the freedom of strikes in Crimea, which it's anti-access aerial denier, area denial campaign, which has been really, really successful, has done in the future. Now, the key variable at the moment, it seems to me, in the Zaporizhia, which I've always said is, to me, the sort of triangle of decision, is the five airborne regiments which have been put in there to reinforce the 58th Combined Arms Army of the Russians. So if you can go through them, because they are the best Russian troops that they have, then attrition by overstretch might mean that we are into something serious in terms of the counteroffensive going further and faster mm. if they can do that. But there's there a lot of variables there. It needs to be appreciated, doesn't it, Chip? The difficulty of getting through the first line of defence. When I say first line, there's a lot of components to it. Ditches, trenches, dense minefields and artillery. That's right. And that's what slows you down. Now, we have planning yardsticks for everything in the military, you know, which conditions how far you can go in one day, one hour, if you have certain levels of artillery support, engineer support, whatever it might be. Uh, But I don't think anyone, particularly since the Second World War, has come come against a defensive system of such depth and of such ferocity in terms of mines, defensive barriers, trenches, artillery fire, all supported by loitering munitions and KA-52, the um, the assault helicopters, which do slow you down. That will give you a new metric for the future, which is you cannot go very far, very fast in a day initially until you can break the resistance and the will to fight. And even if you break the will to fight, uh, a minefield doesn't care about your will, will to fight. It is a physical obstacle which is immune to that sort of... Uh, breaking of the will. Yeah, I was reading just this morning about those minefields where you could see five miles mines in, in, the, in, the, in an area of a square metre. Almost, It sounds almost in, impenetrable. Just last thought on China. The, the Chinese diplomat Wang Yi is in Russia and there's talk of Vladimir Putin going to China in October. Now, we've been focusing on, on North Korea in recent days. I mean, uh, Kim Jong-un has been there, but China really is one to watch. Yeah, well, we know that there are four days of strategic security consultations. And, of course, that can mean anything. It can mean something political. It can mean something economic. It mean, can mean something social political. I think you'll see a, a number of sort of good words coming out about, you know, not to do with the no limits partnership, but about, you know, the multipolar world and abandoning a Cold War mentality and the imperialist mindset of the West. But I think also to try and get the uh, sort of non-aligned or those that they want to get into their their sort of orbit, I think you'll see something again about trying to get the grain, uh, grain situation re-energized. Because it's worth saying that one of the uh, one of the 
parts of the Chinese peace plan, which was the last time that Wang Yi was there, was point nine was facilitating grain exports. Now, again, the, you know, most of the international community would like that to happen uh, because, um, you know, they're suffering from either a lack of grain or b the, the price of it. So I think you'll see something on that. I don't think you'll see something t uh, really significant in terms of them supporting the Russian position in terms of um, ammunition 